so, yeah. 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 Very careful. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. This is the last panel, and we're going to, I think, be dead by the time it's finished of exhaustion. But this is a really important panel because what we're hoping to do is to be able to, through the question and answers and the dialogue and debate um, amongst the panelists and all the experts who are here, um, come to some kind of formulation of some recommendations that we can make um, that may somehow um, make us one step closer to the question of equality for all Iranians and equitable treatment for all Iranians. Um, and we hope to be able to take it to um, the International Forum with the recommendation. It is possible um, that aspects of it may turn into a petition, perhaps, <laughs> but we don't know. We'll see what is the best way of going forward and putting it out there. So that, these are all points for discussion. In this um, document that we put on your chairs, I don't know, did you get one of these? We've made, um, you can have that one. We've made some suggestions, <coughs> but these are just our suggestions. Um, first of all, are there any questions for the panel before we get into discussing recommendations? Are there any questions? Yes. <coughs> who is it to? I don't know who can answer my question, but my question is, with the rise of ISIS and the extreme fundamentalist views and the equality and extremism that is spreading in the area, um, I believe that the situation of the Iranian people is in a really very uh, great stance because in the middle of all this uh, chaos that we see in the region, somehow the Iranian regime, the Islamic <coughs> Republic, seems moderate. I just wanted to hear the views of some of the panelists. What do you think and what are the repercussions of this rise of extremism in the in the area on the Islamic Republic and on the Iranian people. Who wants to take that first? Can I show you? Let me just make a brief comment on that. Um, I remain concerned uh, from a different perspective. Firstly, that Iran's own treatment of the Sunni community there has been hardening over the past couple of years, could get worse uh, as a consequence of that. Um, if you, uh, you will recall that the biggest con <coughs> point of contest between me and Larajani is that my attempt to inquire about the fate of three Ahwazi men whom they regard as terrorists, and they were called me a terrorist sponsor. So you know, this, this is a concern, a concern I have. Um, in terms of broader strategic context, um, to see Iran as moderate, I think, is a misconception. Uh, because no other country has had, for uh, as long as Iran has had, the kinds of violations that we have been no, 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 noting. It was a mistake to, mistake to see Iran as a moderate oasis amongst, you know, a, a, a sort of, you know, a, a region of a, a otherwise a lot of chaos. Um, there has been some concern that, uh, from a strategic <coughs> perspective, that ISIS may in, invite countries to look at Iran as a partner and therefore kind of, you know, turn a blind eye what's happening in the country. In all my discussions with various countries uh, who are concerned about this phenomenon, uh, I have given, been given assurances that uh, all policymakers remain fairly focused on the troubling situation in Iran, and therefore unlikely to think that, you know, just because there is another concern that people forget about the really bad situation in the country. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that? <coughs> yes. point of view in terms of racism, uh, I think there is the right interrelations between um, discrimination against uh, uh, minor, minorities in terms of their belief and uh, uh, racial issues because uh, we got um, Sunni, Sunnis inside Iran, we can see uh, the relations between Baluch, Kurdistan and uh, Turkmen people. So if you exclude them from, in, in terms of their constitutional issues, I, I mean, uh, from uh, the positions of uh, leadership, uh, uh, guardian council, and all that top positions, it, it means that you exclude in part of Iran in terms of their, uh, um, their race uh, and ethnic groups. So uh, I, I just, I mean this comment, it is not about me, it's about 
in the big part of Iran, they got in exchange a type of woman. Thank you for that. We, we've uh, talked about millions of people being um, discriminated against legally yes, in practice, yes. including the Sunni population in that. Because when, when you talk about um, the situation in Iran, they always say, well, 0.2% of the population is a religious minority, which is a fallacy because the way that they treat the Sunnis and the kind of discrimination against the Sunnis also. But we, we don't have figures. That's the, one of the main problems is we just don't know how many people we're talking about. It's always a rough estimate. None of their figures can be trusted. Um, you have to guess in the Kurdistan, in the Baluchistan, in Turkmen region, what percentage of them are Sunnis. But then Sunnis live throughout Iran. They may be concentrated, but they're spread also <coughs> throughout Iran. So we, we've just talked about millions. Yeah. Yes. I have a question to anybody and everybody. And does anybody know how the uh, official Iranian Republic uh, reacted to the news that the Yazidi or Izadi peoples were being so heavily persecuted, killed off, and then wiped out? Has there been a comment? Has there been a sympathetic um, comment? Or we just a... totally ignored it because more or less the, the followers of the same concept in Iran are being treated not differently from ISIS. Yeah, I mean, and I ask that because, of course, uh, some of you may or may not know that it is, uh, it is a theory that the Izadi people and also the Al-Hath people uh, yeah, Iran, are, are very closely connected to Zoroastrianism. And so I was kind of interested in seeing how they are reacting to that. We have very little information about the mm -hmm. Izadis. There's a lot of information. I've been able to get a lot of information about the RSR. Mm -hmm. And that will be a very strong part of the report once it's finally finished. But I don't have a lot of information about the Izadis or even the numbers of them in yes, Iran. Indeed. But I mean, indeed, the reaction of the Republic, did they say yeah. this was a criminal act? Did no. they say anything? Or did no, they I think like it's been ignored. I think totally it's been ignored. ignored. Mm -hmm. Dion, you have a point? You know, the. The Islamic Republic of Iran has knows very well how to play the weak points of Iranian society. <coughs> and they know very well how to play um, groups one against the other. So I think that we should, uh, the previous panel really went on the issue of principle. And I think that we should really try not to fall into this pitfall of trying to look at numbers, at whether it's, you know, it's more, as Naz was saying earlier on, whether it's more or less, how many people there are, whether they are Muslims or whether they're not Muslims. <clears throat> I think that there are, I mean, there are issues of freedom of religion and belief. For example, the right not to believe. So what about atheists in Iran? We haven't talked about them. It's not a religious minority. But it's also it's part of freedom, freedom of religion minority. and belief. Yeah. So I think that there are a lot of issues that <clears throat> ultimately, at the end of the day, what matters is whether somebody has the right to believe in what he or she wants and practice it. And whether it's one person, person or hundreds of persons, whether they belong to one ethnic group or not, whether they're spread or whether they're not. And I think that these are all the things that the Islamic Republic plays in order to call people terrorists, in order to bring people one against the other, in order, and I think that it is wonderful that we have been able to overcome that a lot. The fact that we're all here sitting is a sign that we have been able to overcome that a lot. But there's still a long way to go, and I think that we should really be, keep always that in mind. Thank you for that. <coughs> I just want to come to that. Um, I think earlier both Nas and Bayan made a very valid point that uh, you know we, how we frame this issue it should go beyond specific specific minorities. It's it's a wider problem. Even if you are in the dominant majority, as it were, if you didn't subscribe to the very, the accepted version of it, then your rights, your <coughs> physical integrity, was at stake. So I think we should frame it in a sense that it speaks to. All, Everybody, everybody is actually a victim here mm -hmm. because the basic right uh, uh, inherent to a person uh, to have your own sort of beliefs is not there. And that's a very important way of, sort of think, projecting this. Yes, thank you. <coughs> I would love to, and we have been Can I just explain that um, we've allowed Mr. Beheshti yes. to join us because he's a member of the Gonabadi Dervishes. And uh, so he's going to give us his viewpoints on that. I think you know, we have to elaborate a little bit uh, into that question of Mr. Hill. 
is the, the comparing the Iranian government to ISIS, I think is the wrong things to do here because ISIS is the born is born from the <coughs> ideology of Iranian government. ISIS these days mm -hmm. they do all these things that what we are we all are witness clearly, obviously. But Iranian government did this for past 36 years hidden, secretly. We can't forget what happened to Parwane Fouhar, sorry. We can't forget the group of, group of Qanat. The group of Qanat did exactly <laughs> thing. You know, they chopped people by seven pieces and they put them in, in the irrigated um, yes. system on the ground. So it is, it is the same thing. Nothing changed, but thanks to ISIS these days, they make it clear for us. ISIS is the baby of Iranian regime. So the main problem in the whole Middle East, I think, is Iranian government. Thank you. Are there any questions for the panel? Uh, if we look at the issue and the problems of the Sunnis from a historical point of view, it is 500 years that the Shiism has become the official religion of Iran. And in the 500 years, except for the short time of Nader Shah, no Sunni has become king, prime minister, <coughs> leader, minister, uh, a general, and so forth. So 500 years, is not enough for the Sunnis and other religious minorities now, Baha'is, to know that uh, there is uh, the psychology of Shiism is against the Sunnis. And this is how the Shiism in Iran was created and developed. And now 30% of the Iranian population is Sunni. All the uh, Baluchistan, the South, Bandar Abbas, Boucher, Kurdistan, uh, uh, Eastern part of, part of Iran. 40% of Ardabil uh, uh, in, in, in Azerbaijan, uh, the northern part of Iran. Azerbaijan, Kurdistan. So what really from the point of human rights, what options are open? to Sunnis who have been practically suppressed for 500 years. And there is no any outlook for the, a better future. I have a question um, sort of following on from that, which has really um, troubled me, and I hope somebody may. 126 religious ceremonies are marked during the school calendar year. That's quite apart from the fact that children have to um, participate in all the Islamic ideology that's being taught to them. In the textbooks, Saeed Pevadin, in the analysis that he's done, talks about certain um, textbooks have phrases that says, um, there is no difference between Shia and Sunni, we are brothers, we believe in Islam, we believe in Prophet Muhammad, we believe in Quran, there is no difference. But then in practice, we have Ashura, we have all these other religious, Shia religious holidays. And from a point of social cohesion and the kind of respect that you would have for your other human beings, the fact that constantly um, leaders of a religious community are being ridiculed and being humiliated and um, downgraded because of the governing ideology. Um, I'm sort of thinking, Allah, my problem is how can we formulate a recommendation that could go to an end to these kind of celebrations or religious things, because this is the governing ideology, that actually hurts social cohesion, that actually incites anger and hatred against the people who are de doing these things. A lot of the conversations I had with the Sunnis in Iran, it was coming back that um, constantly we can't use our names, but then they have their names constantly. Um, we can't mark our Eid of Orban and whatever, because the date is different. We have to wait until the Shias 
celebrate it. We can't celebrate with the rest of the world. So um, I, but this is something that's really troubled me, of how, how can you recommend that to a country so ingrained in its identity, religious identity, in its Islamic Shia identity, um, of somehow overcoming these. There's so many different issues. It's the education system, the, um, the cultural things that go behind it. And I just haven't been able to find a solution. So I hope that um, somehow we can find a wording that we can say something. Because if we can overcome that, then we can overcome it for the others, I think. Maybe I can just uh, uh, make some comments on that. I think we have two <coughs> fronts on which we have to struggle. One is the international system, the international human rights system. But the other one, which is far more important, is the transforming culture of Iran itself. And this is a, a huge opening, which didn't exist some years ago. Uh, and uh, I think the emphasis on culture is extremely important. And I think here about um, the famous photo now of Mohammad Nourizad, once uh, you know, one of the greatest supporters of the Islamic Republic of Iran, going to the home of a four-year-old Baha'i child whose parents are in prison and kissing his feet and asking for forgiveness. The, extraordinary power of his courage. So I think that we all need to come, as you know, Dion said, come out of our own ghettos, our own communities, and build these transcendent ties and develop a culture of solidarity. Because it's not about Zoroastrians and Baha'is and Muslims and non-Muslims. and it's, it's about human rights, which is about creating an identity built on human dignity. So we need to change our own discourses, and we need to uh, move beyond these very regimented identities which actually have been imposed on us. We define ourselves now as this or that religion and community because we live in a system which uh, is going back 500 years in time and defining people's rights based on their religious identity. And, and, and the, the point that you made I think is a very powerful one about 500 years of uh, let's say Shia Islam as the official religion. Uh, and it made me realize that, well, um, where are we in relation to 500 years ago? And uh, what is the process that we're undergoing as we undergo the transition from tradition to modernity? Now, I could say the same thing about Europe. The Peace of Augsburg in 1555, the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, the Thirty Years' War, the bloody <coughs> massacres between uh, Protestants and Christians in, in Europe. And the, there was a, a process of tremendous historical violence uh, which forced Europe to develop a different outlook on human rights. It was not just a utopian moment. It was born of tremendous violence. Uh, so when I, when I think about the region, uh, well, let's look at Saudi Arabia. Uh, let's look at the uh, Shia minority in Saudi Arabia. And, and we see uh, the exact mirror of a system which systematically discriminates based on religious identity. There's absolutely nobody in Saudi Arabia in any public position who does not subscribe to Wahhabism. Mm. And, and I think that I would just uh, say that it's not just that, let's say, ISIS is a creation of Iran. It's also a, a creation of other forces in the mm. region <laughs> that are using hatred mm -hmm. and, and religion to rip apart communities that have lived together for centuries. I have dealt with some human rights cases in Turkey now. And Turkey is probably one of the best countries in the region. But I've worked on the case of Haram Dink, the Armenian journalist that was assassinated in the streets of Istanbul with the complicity of the Turkish police, where people still are afraid of speaking about the Armenian genocide because they're going to be prosecuted, they're going to be attacked. Uh, and let's not forget <clears throat> the Armenian genocide of 1915. Let's not forget that Constantinople used to have a, an incredibly diverse population of Greeks and Armenians. And, and, and now we see, for example, that uh, someone like Oran Pamuk, the Nobel Prize laureate, is speaking about the Armenian genocide. As a Turkish man, he says that for Turkey to rid itself of this uh, hatred and this ultranationalism, I, as a Turk, have to stand in solidarity with the Armenians. Let's look at the situation of the Kurds in Iraq. 200,000 Kurds uh, gassed in, 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 in 1988 with barely anyone uh, raising it as an issue. So I, I'm, I, what I'm saying is that we're not alone. Iran is not unique. I think that is not a good way of looking at this. It's actually discouraging to some think Iran is exceptional. Iran will never change because Iran is unique. Iran is not unique. 
Let's look at, look at Afghanistan. I was just talking to the Afghanistan Human Rights Commission. One and a half million Afghans were exterminated between 1979 and 89 by the Soviet Union. But that even that society now has a Human Rights Commission. They are beginning to rebuild their society. And I would actually say Iran is the, in the best position in the region. Iran is in the best position because the much worse alternative would have been a failed state scenario and disintegration into violence. And that's what I've seen working in my line of work. I can tell you the worst case scenario is not what we see today. And the best case scenario is a nonviolent transition uh, based on dialogue, based on creating a constituency within the country. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, time is not on the side of the hardliners, as I said. The, the more they increase their hatred and violence and propaganda, the more they demonstrate their own desperation. Mm -hmm. And they cannot indefinitely <coughs> rule through uh, terror uh, and, and, and torture. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the power of our own dialogue and, and discourse. And the past 500 years are not the uh, model <laughs> for the future. So are you saying that we have to wait another 500 years? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. But what, I, what I'm... So what? No, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that um, there is a historical process at play, and Iran is not unique in the region. That the, this, this culture of, in this, of discrimination, of entrenched discrimination and <clears throat> hatred and tolerance, unfortunately, is endemic in the region. It is by no means unique to Iran. But I actually think that Iran, uh, thanks to 35 years of a totalitarian ideology, still has the richest, most diverse, most sophisticated civil society. Uh, and we should not imagine that that society has simply disappeared overnight, despite all the best efforts of the regime. So that is a great space in which we can try to open a dialogue and move forward. Thank you. What do you want? Um, I, I'm, I want to agree with you, but on the other hand, if, if you look at Baluchistan right now, time is not on people's side because um, a lot of young men, uh, a lot of uh, people are being executed. So we're losing a huge population that are active, that could contribute to democracy. And I think we should, um, we should be careful when saying that the transition to democracy is time. It's not time. Not when you're losing a population, when you're losing important aspects um, of, 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 of the strength, which is the people. And I think we should somehow, this should be a part of our recommendation. How do we frame, how do we um, reframe the regime from using the excessive use of death penalty? I think, and, and also the fact that, I mean, public hangings, that must be psychologically, it's a nightmare. I mean, living in a society like that where, oh well, I'm going to the movies today. No, I'm going to see someone being hanged. I think it, we should pinpoint that and somehow, I don't know how we can do it without just pointing the finger, but. Thank you. Well, I would like to add to <coughs> Dr. Payon, and I totally agree, but the last point I think is not right to say Thanks to Iranian 36 years old Iranian ideology, thanks to the very rich culture of Iranians, because that culture doesn't matter. Uh, Ayatollahs come and conquer the country, the country or the uh, Kangis Khan come and conquer the country. They inhalate it inside that rich culture. So that rich culture exists and remains. Doesn't matter how long it takes, but that's, that's what I would like to do. I think one of the important things that, um, through the work that we've done in the years has come through is this return to an Iranian identity um, rather than a religious identity. We did a survey in 2007 on identity and we asked, one of the questions was where do you derive your identity from and we gave various time periods and the majority, over 5,000 people participated, it was an internet survey with all the pitfalls that internet surveys have, um, over half of the participants were from Iran. And overwhelmingly, whether they were from Iran or from outside Iran, the answer to where do you derive your um, identity from went back to ancient Persia. Mm. Yeah. Not necessarily to Zoroastrianism, but it went back to ancient Persia. And the number of people who said, 
um, the Islamic period, because that was one of the um, choices, when you trace who they are through um, the demographic questions, then you suddenly realize they are members of the regime who are in the armed forces and whatever. So it's very clear who is part of the way that we, f we phrase things. You can actually trace who is in the end answered your questions. But overwhelmingly, it was this return to the culture of ancient Persia. Whatever that means, I don't know. We didn't define it. We just gave time periods. But that seems to be the case. And you know, you o hear over and over again about the religious <laughs> symbols that um, young people in Iran wear. The, the sale of Farvahar is overwhelmingly high. And apparently, sometimes, even in Mashhad, it overtook the sale of Allah outside the yeah, uh, Imam Reza. So, you know, it, it's saying something. It was also so high that they actually passed a law to ban it. And they defined the people who were allowed to wear it actually would. And I, I got a copy of the law that says that they had to produce identity cards to show that they were justified and allowed to wear it. How funny. They obviously didn't impose it. They weren't able sure. to. But it was That's possible. interesting. <laughs> yes. Can I add just one thing? I think that the only thing that we have, again, to be careful about, I'm sorry, I'm just, but it's all my antennas that go up <clears throat> when we talk about Iranian identity is that the Iranian identity should not be opposed to the Afghani identity. Mm. No, absolutely. Or anti Arab. <clears throat> or the Baluch or the Arabs or the Turks. So I think that we have to, <clears throat> I think that what we really have to keep in mind all the time is that we have to be inclusive and inclusive on all levels. Mm. So it's inclusive on gender, it's inclusive on you know, na nationalities, it's inclusive on religion, beliefs, etc., etc. Yeah. To come to recommendations, because I was thinking <clears throat> about your question, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we have, the Baha'is have in common, particularly with the, 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 the Christians, <clears throat> the Christians who have converted and the Dugunawadi Darvishes is that... Apart from being apostates. Obviously. Well, no, no, that's it. Is that we are the subject of a fantastic interest from Seda Osima, from the international, uh, from the Iranian broadcasting service, creating all sorts of films and, um, you know, interviews of Baha'is who have now converted back to Islam and I, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and the solution against all these is exactly as actually in the Iranian press law. It's right of reply. And it exists in the press law of the Islamic Republic. And I think that really, ultimately, freedom of expression, the fact that people are allowed to come and say, this is what I believe. Let it, hear it from me, who is a Baha'i. Hear it from me, who is a Gonabadi Dervish. Hear it from me, who is a Jew, hear it from me, who is a Zoroastrian, etc. Rather than hear it from somebody else who is going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what this is. And I think that the more that, we, that, that there is this freedom of expression that is developed, where people are allowed to say and to discuss. And again, as Nan said, to be able, no, I think it was Heiner who's, I don't know, anyway, somebody in the panel Someone. said, uh, to, the, to be able to challenge people's belief. I think it was Heiner who said. And that's, that's really not an issue. I think we have to be allowed to be challenged and to ask questions. And the strength of one's faith is actually to allow to be challenged and to ask questions. And I think that a religion that does not allow challenge means that it actually is quite weak. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. <coughs> Can I have yes. one more? Just yes, following Diane's suggestion that we be all inclusive, let's also correct our vocabulary and don't call us minorities. We are Iranian Jews, Iranian Baha'is, Iranian Kurds, Iran we are all Iranians, we are not minority, minority groups. And that, I think, adds to the feeling of separation that we are not part of the main community. Mm -hmm. We are part of the main community, we are all the same. And we can, irrespective of our religion and ethnic background, We've, we've used the word groups or communities in our report yes. because we, we've strongly right. believed that we shouldn't use the word minorities as well. Patty, you had a question. Uh, I think our ultimate goal should be separation uh, of the religion from the government. And uh, that's why we are all here, <coughs> all different groups, different, different minorities, whether it's religion minority or a nationality or race or whatever the solution is. The solution should be a secular government. That's the ultimate. 
and then we are all will be, we will all be in the same boat, and we should be in the same boat to actually fight the government, to actually really uh, that opportunity to be all inclusive. We can't have the same religion government and say, oh, let us be the government. <coughs> It won't happen peacefully, it won't happen. And if we continue like, like they are doing, uh, um, oppressing, uh, suppressing all different groups, um, that's, that's not uh, good for the peace uh, of Iran. That's, you know, some people believe, you know, because ISIS is, is a threat. So we are better without ISIS, we better stay on this, on this government. Because it eventually it's going to burst. And eventually, if this continues, I'm afraid that you know all, all of us may fight each other because that's what the government wants to, to divide and rule, and we should really go opposite. Uh, Thank opposite you. It. Can I ask if there's anyone who has a specific question about anything that was said? Because I want to move. And also, I wanted to know uh, which uh, or any of these uh, communities what they have done inside their communities to address this especially when it comes to discrimination against women and children. Thank you. Nazira, do you want to take that? Um, I think the, you know, I don't know if you want it to remain as one page, but if you want it to no, remain... No, no, it can... But expand. presumably you don't want it to be 800 pages. So, I mean, I think we have 66 years of experience uh, with international human rights law, and there is a framework, and it is balanced... Uh, you know, it is balanced. So you have Article 18 on freedom of religion and belief, you have Article 19 on freedom of expression, uh, opinion and expression, and you have Article 20 on incitement, which there has been a six year, seven year effort in the Office of High Commissioner to um, say what that means in reality. So I think the shorthand would be to say, in accord, you know, within the international human rights framework, okay? So that incitement is not included. And yes, freedom of religion or belief includes the right to interpret your religion or belief. And it includes the right to opt out. And it does include selective opt out. So, you know, you might want to practice this area. I'm, you know, I'm not saying it is a, you know, this isn't religious advice, but the human rights framework <laughs> says that you can pick and choose. You might, you might say that's not religiously authentic, that's your choice. But human rights law allows you to say, I'm a Catholic who, uh, you know, practices, uh, you know, uh, birth prevention. Uh, and, you know, I know the Pope forbids it, but that's what I do. You know, so you can, you can interpret and you can select, and that is your practice. And you can be advised by your religious leaders so that this free is... free to interpret. Yeah, you're, you're, you, and, you know, your leader also has the... Uh, or your community can advise you that that's not the line of the Pope and you can carry on or not, you know. Well, if you live in a secular state, you can choose what you want to do. But if you live in a religious state, and it doesn't matter whether it's Islamic Republic of any or any other religious state, you're bound to follow one of the religious practices. In Iran, the, the three recognized minorities are allowed to choose their own practices on the basis of their own rules. Now, you may not like it because Going back uh, 50 years ago, the Jewish community rules were worse than the Muslim community as far as the inheritance for women was concerned. But you had to choose either to follow the Muslim rules or you had to convert to Islam, to use the state rules about that one, or stay with your, within your own religion. For instance, the, the, the daughters who were married would not inherit from the father under the Jewish law. And in 1974, we had to bring the community together to change it and bring it to the same standard as Islamic law, that the women receive half of the, uh, girls receive half of the boys, which is again discriminatory, but we brought it to that effect. You don't have that choice. If you don't marry under, for instance, Jewish law, if you're Jewish, you have to marry under Islamic law. That may be offensive to a lot of people. They may not like the rules of that. One. So you're limited in a state that is not a secular state, with the religious rules. <coughs> and I'm sorry. Do you want to say anything? Sorry. Anyone else on that? No. Yes. Um, uh, in our discourse, also, we need to see pluralism as a, as a strength, not as a weakness, to see it as an asset, not as a liability. And um, uh, one of the issues, for example, is to give people a vision of the future. I think one of the problems is that the current generation have so been conditioned 
by what they've experienced, that they're not uh, capable of seeing anything better. So, for example, we, we had this discussion, I'd written something a while ago about the nationalities question. I said, well, imagine if instead of repressing the Kurdish population, uh, Mahabad becomes the center for Kurds throughout the region, which is now the function of Erbil. If you think about Erbil as becoming a thriving city uh, because of the freedom that they enjoy, well, why shouldn't that be in Iran? Why shouldn't Iran actually, instead of repressing its Kurds, uh, uh, make all the Kurds look towards the Kurdish population. And, and in, in many respects, Iran would be the natural place, given the affinity of the Kurds with Iranian culture. Mm -hmm. What could say the same thing about the Baluch population in Iran? Why can't that be a center for the Baluch in Pakistan and Afghanistan? Or why couldn't Dubai be in Ahwaz? Why couldn't we attract the Arab population in the region? So I, I think that uh, given the tremendous a surge of nationalism that there is in Iran, and this whole question of what kind of Iranian identity are we talking about, maybe we need to make human rights a patriotic duty of every Iranian should be supporting the rights of all Iranians, and that should be a redefinition um, of the whole discourse of nationalism as opposed to uh, an inclusive uh, uh, culture based on human rights, and one which will uh, make Iran a leader among nations. And I think that in our writings and our talks and, and, and other contexts, we should also give the young people the hope that this too can happen in Iran. I was a student during the apartheid years in South Africa. It would have been impossible to imagine Nelson Mandela freed from prison and becoming the democratic elected uh, leader of South Africa. Well, it happened. It happened. And why are we so convinced that Iran is absolutely exceptional? Everywhere in the world will change except Iran. That's nonsense. So, uh, as I told the mothers of Khawaran, we should see the day when a democratically elected female president of Iran goes to Khawaran with flowers and begs forgiveness from the mothers of Khawaran, and Evin becomes a museum rather than a prison where young people go and read about the dark past, <coughs> never to repeat it again. All of those things can happen, and we need to begin to visualize it and put that out there in, in the public space in Iran. On that wonderful optimistic mm. note, can I come back <laughs> to our um, recommendations and how we can formulate something that we can um, work towards? Something that we did um, on executions um, in Iran. In 1999, we um, had a similar meeting about um, the execution, using execution as a tool of oppression and intimidation. And we had representations from every single um, nationality, ethnic, whatever you want to call them, religious. We had individuals, we had political parties, everybody was there. And they all agreed to sign something that said wherever there is a hangman's noose, all of us will stand up against it. Not just, not just the Kurds for the Kurds and the Baluch for the Baluch, but all of us. And they signed a pledge. I'm not suggesting that we all sign a pledge, but I'm suggesting if we agree that we should speak up the inclusiveness, that it's all, it's all of our issues, it's not just the Baha'i issue or a Sunni issue or a Shia issue, it's all of our issues, it's something, it's a fundamental human right, so it's all of our issues, and it would be good to be able to do that. Yes, you don't need to put your hand. Yes, I, I think we should, um, after having a sort of forward-looking uh, blurb at the beginning, um, I think it should focus on the most urgent. Okay. Um, uh, Perhaps we can't fully agree on that, but you know what I mean, the most devastating and uh, to the more symbolic, because, um, and executions has to be there, imprisonments, torture has to be there. Um, and, and that's also shared with wider society, it's not only uh, something that is possessed by yeah. religious minorities. And after that, I think we have to be, you know, the symbolic is beautiful, but you also don't want to be a red, like a red uh, rag of saying we must we must now make, I don't know, Christmas an official holiday because that might also be a little bit too far for, uh, it might upset people. So you don't want to upset people. I mean, let's sort of... Well, that was my question about the Sunday yeah. and Shia holidays. I, I don't know how no, you so can word something that's not going to I mean, to I don't think the first demand of anybody is let's, um, I don't know, is the presidency. You know, there's a lot more that has to happen that creates an environment where the presidency mm -hmm the religious affiliation of the presidency is no longer a question. So, I mean, I think we have to talk, uh, we have to phase it, mm -hmm. we have to do it in order of gravity, and we have to know who, uh, who is responsible. If this is addressing the government, then religious-based laws are there, but discrimination within 
a Kurdish family shouldn't be here. It's not the place for it. Okay. Not to say it's not serious, but you know, if this is addressing the government, mm -hmm. let's keep it very clear and even say which state authority. Mm -hmm. I have just one. Uh, yeah. I think uh, we're talking about groups, but we haven't really addressed. Uh, um, uh, got my English. Freedom of association. Freedom of association. Uh, no, I, I'm talking about homosexuality. People who. Exactly. How how do we fit in? That well, again, we've we fitted in 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 the report that will one day be published. Okay. We've looked at gen the issue of gender and LGBT. Yeah. Um, is okay. part of that, and right. we are absolutely okay, looking so at that. that. Yeah, right. it's in there. Okay. But looking at the recommendations, for for me, from a religious point of view, I mean, you're all you may disagree, um, because of the question of apostasy. Um, the right to conversion and right to recognition is something that's high on my agenda. But I don't know how realistic is that. I mean, how, how can we stand up to um, religious laws that have been there for <coughs> centuries? I mean, what we've attempted to say, um, take appropriate measures to combat intolerance, um, to, I thought that since recognition seems to offer some kind of limited protection, maybe then we should ask for all faiths in Iran to be recognized as a religion. I don't know how far-fetched that is, how we can formulate that in, and whether you agree that something like that should be formulated in. Can yes. I, first of all, just a technical issue, that apostasy is not against converting to a religion, it's against converting out of Islam. Yes. So, there is no restriction. You can become a Jew, can become a, a Christian. It's it's not bother, bothering is Islamic Republic. Yeah. It's only moving Islam. out of Islam okay. is there to that. So it's it's a, it's the other way around. It's the other way. Okay. <laughs> it's not the Thank right of conversion yeah. into another religion, but right of from conversion Islam. So out we of Islam. we have to word it specifically yes. to mean no. that. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Uh, you know all the various special rapporteurs from on freedom of religion belief from Abdel Fattah Moore, followed by Asma Jahangir and now Heino Bielefeld, have been very clear on the issue of recognition. They're saying that it's not for a state to decide what is a religion and what is not. So I think it would, it would be a little bit of a dangerous path to go. And moreover, <clears throat> what about, as I mentioned earlier on, atheists? So I think that, it, it, I don't think that the issue of recognition is going to resolve the issue of freedom of religion or belief. Excuse me. And it's not only constitutional law that is the problem. It's penal law, it's family law, it's press <coughs> law, it's, it's education law, it's every law. So <coughs> fixing the constitution won't necessarily mean anything anyway. It's just like they try to get rid yeah. of the whole yeah. question of recognition. Yes. So not mention recognition at all. No. So how can we then ask... Um, Full respect and equality, equal enjoyment to all human rights for all. What you're asking is asking for a secular state. Exactly. <laughs> well, then we go to the definition of secular. But no, it's, 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 there, there are provisions in the Constitution already which talk about equal citizenship. Uh, uh, and, you know, there are elements that are contradictory, but we can emphasize those elements which support uh, equal and non-discrimination. And I think we have to be careful not to derogate from international standards. We have to be very clear that, yes, we mean that. Even if they reject it, we, we mean right to convert, we mean right, right of expression. Mm -hmm. These, I think, have to be asserted. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, in addition to you know, the government of Iran, we also need to have you know, those outside also back these demands. Otherwise, you know, we, we, we are kind of being very, very parochial in what we do articulate. Yeah. I, I, if I may just reinforce what Dr. Shahid has said, uh, the Constitution of Iran provides um, for religious freedom. And Article 13, although it, it limits recognition, does not say that those who are not recognized have no religious rights. And uh, Islamic, the Islamic Republic, from the very beginning of the revolution, for example, the persecution of the Baha'is has always said they are a political group. We will not harm the Baha'is for their religious beliefs, but only to the extent that... So their line has been quite consistent because it would be contrary to their own constitution. But in practice, of course, the reality is that they're politicizing religious belief in order to achieve their own But there's also uh, Article 14, the last sentence in Article 14, that gives them the scope to do what they do and to persecute um, on religious grounds. But bring charges of national security and espionage and collaboration. Exactly. So they it's have that, in, it's in the constitution, but then in clause nine or something of article three, 
they talk about equality for all. Uh, but, but so I think, it's contradictory. Yeah. Well, yes and no, because even if we look at Articles 18 and 19 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, religious freedoms are subject to public order and morality. That's recognized. The question is, how do you interpret those exceptions? Do you interpret them narrowly and rationally and in a proportionate manner? Or According you, to international standards. Exactly. Or do you abuse them <laughs> to, to justify any form of repression that's politically expedient? Mm -hmm. So I think that it's... it's, it's um, not just a question of the law, but it's the question of the policies and the culture which sustains these very abusive treatments. Uh, and then even if, if we look at the nature, uh, let's say, of the revolutionary courts in Iran, we see how deeply flawed uh, they are as, as judicial institutions. So it, it's not just a question of legal standards, but it's the question of the whole <coughs> culture and policy that sustains these particular interpretations. And, and I just want to add by saying that one of the big rallying cries in the streets of Iran have always been uh, Iran for all Iranians. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes back to uh, those who believe that, well, within the Constitution, we have provision for uh, uh, equality. And that is all we're asking. We're asking for, for respect for the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Strategically, that may be a, a better approach, at least in the short term. Okay. Chrissy, what do you, I was just going to come to you about that. Yes, I just I feel like um, quite a lot today has been said about you know solidarity and how far is there solidarity between groups, and I wonder if that's not maybe a fruitful way forwards because I speak to people, um, for example, people in the Christian community who have no idea of the suffering that the Baha'is endure or that you know the Zoroastrians endure within Iran itself. There's not a great deal of knowledge of what is actually going on. Most of the knowledge we hear about out here. Um, is there a way to inform these communities within the nation so that we see more of these actions of solidarity? You know, if we've been hearing from, from Chris that, um, you know, protecting minorities leads to a stable state, and yet, on the other hand, hearing that actually for Iran, um, their very authority is based upon this homogenous, you know, Islamic identity. How do we, how do we make that nation listen to this argument? Surely it's got to come from the fact, from the people. You know, they're, they're fundamentally they're afraid of the people. Um, you know, not being happy, not being sold out to this to this uh, version of authority. You know, we saw that in two thousand and nine. They're scared that the people are going to stand up and and say, "You don't have this authority anymore. We don't believe in the revolution anymore." And if communities within Iran know more and can stand up together for each other, could that be a fruitful way forward? And then. What does that mean? Does that mean that we need to get Persian language news agencies sharing more and more so that people inside Iran actually hear what's going on? Well, it's interesting that BBC isn't here today and Voice of America isn't yeah. here today and all of these other... Um, we have other televisions, um, satellite broadcasts into Iran, but none of the main... They've chosen to ignore the session, so... As you said earlier, it's actually the pain of all Iranians. I mean, all Iranians are suffering basic abuse of human rights, and they're suffering from the terror. This is like a Soviet-style terror that's going on in here. It's lasted 70 years in the Soviet Union. It took one very brave leader, Gorbachev, to break the backbone of that terror. Um, and my fear is that all uh, our pious thoughts and all our very good intentions are still always up against the wall of the secret police, the terror, the tapping into all phone conversations and satellite blocking and you know, there is such a proliferation of the machine of terror in Iran. But it's not just a fight of religious minorities. I think a lot of people know very well what's going on. The question is how to... And of course, the Green Revolution was the attempt to break that. And look what it did. It broke the revolution. And every so often, you get a kind of generation of new young people with full of aspiration, full of hope. They try to do something, and again, the terror machine gets them. I don't think that the, the terror machine... I mean, that's a myth that we've got to break, because I don't well, think the Islamic it's... Republic has the power to monitor and surveil 70 million people. No. Um, it can target groups at given times to instill fear. But we are giving them that power by not speaking out. We are saying, yeah. I'm not showing my face on this camera because of what you might do to me, to my family, to my community. We are giving them that power. So by speaking, and that was one of the points I was saying, that we should actually broadcast these things. We should talk about it and bring it into the public domain. So. It's not going to be in that sense. If I'm going to have, um, it's 20 to 7, if I'm going to have one or two recommendations out of this tonight, 
Um, and with your permissions, I'm going to draft something and then send it to you and see if um, we can all agree on something that mm. we can then um, present at international um, yeah. things. Yes. What, I mean, you're saying to just say equal rights for all? Equal enjoyment, ensuring equal enjoyment. So it's not just... So not to be know, specific where you, about what you gender call, What you call... No, no, no. no. But uh, in, in terms of instead of uh, recognition in the Constitution... I think it should, they can be in the constitution and not enjoy as many rights as Zoroastrians. Mm -hmm. Their representative too can be brought to New York and be put on the, uh, you know, put there to, to say, or for, you know, Jewish representative saying we are the freest Jews in the whole world or, yeah. you know, whatever they're yeah. forced to say. He got so, $400,000 for that, for his, for his <laughs> hospital. It's not enough. But, um, but, you know, so, I mean, that's not, that's not what we are, yeah. w what we want is equal enjoyment in practice for all. If, if um, saying, if it's too far to, to ask for a secular state, could, could you have a recognition that, it, that, that Iran is an Islamic state, but that all, all religions are, are, everybody has freedom of religion and belief? So why 